Welcome to this session of glimpse of another method of research and what we generally call as qualitative research methods. And I'm going to give you a snapshot of what these methods are. In the paradigm of health research or any research for that matter, we generally divide methods into quantitative and qualitative. Qualitative methods generally or, uh, find their origin in the science of anthropology, sociology and psychology wherein which is more about dealing with human beings understanding their behaviors. So when we look sort of try to compare the quantitative with the qualitative methods, some of the basic differences that you would see is that the qualitative is always concerned with words, with text. So the data that we get in qualitative methods is actually text and not necessarily numbers that you usually see in quantitative. In qualitative research, what we try to do is to interpret the social reality uh, more from the participants point of view and their experience rather than measuring uh, it objectively uh, from the investigators experience. So this is what is known as the emic perspective. In terms of the logic of inquiry again, qualitative methods are more inductive and they are used in the way to understand the processes that are derived from the data compared to the quantitative methods wherein which is more deductive and where we try to test our formal hypothesis using the data. In terms of the research design, uh, qualitative methods are mostly about interpreting the responses of the participants rather than trying to understand, rather than trying to see whether they, what they are saying is what the investigator feels. Whereas quantitative methods ensure repeatability of the data and the methods are such that if there's, uh, the same study is done by somebody else, we would try to expect similar kind of results. Qualitative methods, uh, the validity is more in terms of credibility of the responses that we get from the respondents and also the credibility of the investigator who is doing this. Uh, again, in terms of the generalization of the qualitative uh, data that we get from these methods, uh, it's more abstract and it is something that transcends boundaries of cultures and we can understand different cultures in, the, in terms of what the participant wants to say. Whereas in terms of quantitative methods, it's more application of the same methodology to different cultures trying to understand different cultures using the same methods. Now, when do you use qualitative research methods? Well, we would want to do that when we really want to understand why the events happened, how did they happen and what circumstances made them to happen. We would like to get more understanding of uh, why these uh, health phenomena are occurring. We want to provide insight into the meanings of the way people behave. We would like to know uh, um, why people are behaving in a certain way. Sometimes the subject matter that we, are under, that we are studying is insufficiently researched and qualitative research methods help us to understand these methods. Many a times uh, if we get into new areas, maybe the subject matter vocabulary is something that we, uh, we need to understand as an investigator and that is again where qualitative research would help us to do that. In terms of social uh, sciences, Qualitative research methods actually help us to view the social phenomena more holistically in terms of how the participants see it through their eyes. Now what are the various methods that we use in qualitative research? The various methods that we use are little different from the methods that we try to use in quantitative research. In qualitative research, the methods are more interpretative and open-ended. They are more iterative rather than fixed. Uh, the method, methodology emerges as the research goes on rather than using a pre-structured format. In fact, qualitative research methods uh, are done so that it becomes a partnership between the participants and the investigators and the investigator actually becomes himself or herself an instrument in the whole research process and it's more like a co-interpreter of what the participant wants to say. The main methods that we use in qualitative research uh, include in-depth interviews, focus group discussions and participant observations. We will go through one by one through each one of them. So in-depth interviews are basically open-ended interviews which are done one-to-one -one between the investigator and the participant 
And these are done to discover the interviewee's own framework of what they mean uh, in their language. It's useful to obtain rich contextualized information and it also avoids imposing the investigator's assumptions over what the participant wants to say. In terms of the techniques that are used in in-depth interviews, although it is open-ended and unstructured, we still follow what we call as an interview guide, which is a set of items that we would like to discuss and get information from the uh, participants. We, uh, we use probes to get more in-depth understanding of the responses from the participants. And in general, uh, the, we collect the respondent's perspective. And the data, as I told you before, is more of the words and that, uh, which are uh, recorded or noted down uh, by the investigator. The level of structure and uh, how we go on with the interview varies depending on how, uh, the, respond, how the response comes from these participants. And as I said, these are, this is more an emergent kind of methodology rather than a fixed pre-structured method. When do we want, when would you like to use in-depth interviews? Well, when the subject matter is complex and we want to know more about it from the respondents, when the respondents probably are more knowledgeable about the, mat the study that we are doing. Uh, many a times for highly sensitive subject matters in like sexual behaviors or family planning issues, uh, drug use, alcohol use, uh, things like that, uh, in-depth interviews are a good way to interact more freely and get more in-depth information from research participants. Many a times the research participants may be geographically dispersed and it's good to uh, talk to them one by one in different time and place and to get more information. Of course, each method has its own advantages and disadvantages. Advantages, the in-depth interviews as per name are most in-depth. We really get to understand why certain behaviors are practiced by individuals and why not. It gives us data on how people think, how do they conceptualize their own behavior, what is their context in terms of the way they do or think. Uh, we are able to get the exact words and language that people may use about the subject matter that we are trying to understand. And it really gives us an insider's perspective of the subject matter that we are trying to do research on. In terms of the disadvantages, uh, it's since it's in, we do few in-depth interviews and we don't do it on many people like hundreds or uh, as we may do in quantitative methods. So uh, there's no specific sampling. The sampling is more convenient and purposeful and we try to get people who are more knowledgeable and who will be able to give us information. This makes the findings from these interviews not generalizable. Uh, in the strict quantitative sense. Many a times the interviews usually go very long, maybe 30 minutes, 40, even go, sometimes may go to more than an hour or so, and you get a lot of data, which means a lot of words. And it could be time consuming to actually analyze these words. Since uh, the analysis is more interpretative, sometimes there is a possibility that what the data means the interpretation could depend on how the researcher uh, feels and interprets this data rather than how the participant would may have wanted it to be known. So these are some of the pros and cons of doing in-depth interviews. The other method is focus group discussions. Again, these are open-ended interviews, but instead of individuals, now we have a small group of people who discuss a certain topic amongst themselves. Usually we have six to eight participants uh, who are a homogeneous group, which means they are similar. They are supposed to be similar in terms of various characteristics like age or gender or socioeconomic status or education, occupation. And uh, this helps us so that the discussion goes on in a more cohesive manner. Usually uh, in a focus group discussion, apart from the, you would have a moderator who moderates the whole discussion and another individual who works as a note taker in order to take down the notes that are being discussed. We could also have recordings, video or audio recordings uh, of these focus group discussions which could be used to an, uh, analyze it later. Again, as in in-depth interviews, we use an interview guide which is basically a set of items that we would like the participants to discuss and we make sure that all the items are discussed uh, in the way that we want them to be. 
However, the interview guides are flexible in the sense of we don't have to follow question one, question two, question three. It basically flows as the discussion flows and the moderator is able to guide the discussion in order to uh, obtain all the information that is there to obtain. When do we use focus group discussions? Uh, these are used when uh, in areas where group interactions give us a lot of in rich information. Again, cost and timing may be issues if, if we were to do in-depth individual interviews. We could, do, we could get information from a lot many more participants in smaller time compared to in-depth interviews. It helps us to generate ideas because we have a group of people who, uh, and more than one person who is able to respond to the various I, uh, ideas that we are trying to generate. Uh, it helps to identify problems and define goals. Uh, many a times, uh, depending on what we are, if you want to understand the local terminologies and the vocabularies, uh, then these focus groups are a good way to understand uh, these issues. And, uh, if we want to again look at if there has been an intervention that has been put into place and we would like to evaluate whether it has worked or not worked, then focus group discussions are a neat way of understanding these issues. Of course, the pros and cons. Uh, we know that there are some people who are more comfortable talking openly in group settings and it may be a natural way for some people to talk and so it's a nice way to understand their problems and personal issues. Uh, it's good. Uh, way uh, to collect information on social norms where people can discuss these issues amongst themselves. And as I said earlier, it provides a lot of data in a limited amount of time compared to doing individual in-depth interviews. However, the disadvantages are that since we are talking to a specific group of people, the data that is generated uh, will depend on the, uh, on the actual make makeup of this group. And it may be difficult to assess the practice of some very personal or sensitive behaviors because people may not like to talk about them in groups. Uh, again, since these are uh, few groups of few people, the data may generally not be generalizable uh, to the bigger target population because what we get uh, in the information is more subject to dominant personalities, maybe people who are more talkative their views may be heard more than people who don't like to talk as much. Of course, uh, as with inter interviews, we, there would be a lot of data that's generated. Many a times it runs into pages and transcribing this can be time consuming. Uh, and of course, it gives uh, a challenge in terms of how we are able to analyze this data. The third more, more, another common method that is used in qualitative research is what is called participant observation. Now this is, comes more from ethnographic and anthropological domain, uh, wherein the researcher himself becomes a participant in a social event or group that we are trying to study. Uh, the good thing is that we get very deep and detailed data because you are, as a researcher, you are part of whatever is happening in that group. However, it sometimes becomes difficult to systematically collect the data because you are right in there and it may be hard to take notes or do recordings. And again, the analytical methods that are used for participant observation data are still evolving and that can again be a challenge in terms of the analysis. Now, coming to analysis, uh, there are various ways in which uh, qualitative data can be analyzed. And as I told you earlier, qualitative data means text. The basically, there are two ways in two methodologies that have uh, been known to used uh, to be used uh, in terms of the analysis. One is called the grounded theory approach, and then there is a content analysis approach. The grounded theory approach uh, goes from an understanding the data and then developing theories based on that. Whereas content analysis is when you start off with a theoretical framework and then you try to analyze the data to understand the theory. What is common in both of these methods is that first of all, you need to transcribe the interviews into text, uh, maybe from local language into English or whatever is the language of the in, uh, investigator. Uh, there is a coding of themes and categories and then relationships are built based on these themes and categories and these are used to understand uh, the perspective of the participants. 
And then quotes are used uh, just as we have tables with data in quantitative uh, research. In qualitative research, you, if you may have seen uh, certain uh, maybe papers from that, you would usually see quotes uh, from the interviews which are used as examples to illustrate uh, the main theme that is generated from this data. Now, how do we use qualitative research methods? You could use qualitative research methods in certain different ways. Uh, it could just be used as a tool to generate ideas. And basically, we try as a preliminary step in developing a quantitative study. For example, if, say, you're trying to understand uh, why people go for, oh, say, open defecation, uh, you, could, you may be developing a, a survey to understand this process, but in order to understand the various categories of questions, we may do a small qualitative uh, study to understand what could be the probable reasons and then use it to modify our, our, the questionnaire for the quantitative survey uh, on this subject. It could be used to help understand the results of a quantitative study. So you've done a quantitative study first, and then you get results which you need to get an in-depth understanding of why you are getting these kinds of results. And again, qualitative methods could help you to do that. Or you could use qualitative research methods as the primary data collection method. And this would be where what your, the objective of the study is to actually understand behaviors, understand, get an in-depth understanding of why people do or not do certain things, why certain behaviors are practiced or not practiced, and you get a lot of rich data in terms of using qualitative data itself. Sometimes, but not necessarily, it can be done along with a quantitative study also. Now, what is more important is that uh, no single method, whether it's quantitative or qualitative, would be able to uh, give you all the explanations. There are, there could even, you may get different explanations or different results when you use different methods. Plus, as an investigator and as it's important in any research study, we need to guard ourselves against systematic biases in terms of data collection and uh, in terms of actually interpreting that data. So it's, it's a good thing to what we call as, what we do as a triangulation, which is basically trying to understand the same uh, topic from different angles through different methods using different theories you, and using different data sources. So there could be a triangulation of analysts or theory which helps us to control for any selective interpretative biases. We could use multiple methods and then focus on what information that, what is the same kind of information that we get from these methods. Or we could use different data sources for the same study and then try to understand the differences that emerge through these data sources, and then put all of these together to actually get a comprehensive understanding of the research topic that we are trying to do. Now, how are these methods useful? Uh, in general, uh, qualitative research methods are very good to actually identify the determinants of health. Why do people behave in a certain way? What are their attitudes? What do they perceive in terms of what they are doing or not doing? Uh, if there have been certain interventions already done, qualitative research methods are a good way to understand why these interventions have been successful or not successful. Uh, qualitative research methods are again a good tool to explain uh, maybe various problems that may have arisen in terms of uh, why people make certain choices or why people use certain services or not use certain services. And in general, overall, again, there are good way to understand uh, the context in which certain decisions are made, whether at the policy level or a social or a legal level. So just to sum up, uh, we have the two paradigms of research, qualitative research and quantitative research. Qualitative research is a very good way to explore, to understand why, and to seek a more depth in understanding of the topic that we are trying to study. While we are doing that, it's always good to use the advantages of both qualitative and quantitative methods to enrich our research process. And of course, triangulate the various methods to check whether the, the analysis that we're getting is something that can be enriching and fruitful. Thank you.